Oke. Okay. Um, yes. And I'm going to start the session in a, in a minute. And uh, I'm, my name is Varun, and I'm working as a special conductor in Kentuck Magarni, uh, Wales, UK. And this is the second lecture in the series. Uh, uh, this is going to be this topic. Today's topic is going to be the investigation and management of colon cancer. And the much of the information is related to the UK practice. And those who are uh, those who want to know how the UK practice goes on with the um, um, in pace with uh, people, those who want to go up here for uh, MRCS and the MRCS exams, uh, maybe uh, maybe benefit out of this lectures. And and this recording is going to be uh, this presentation will be recorded and it will be uh, streamlined or it will be uh, published in YouTube for further for people those who want those who are interested and for future reference and anytime it can be viewed in the YouTube and uh, I would like all the participants to accept this thing and they are not interested in discussion at the end of the uh, discussion at the end of the session will also be uh, published with the uh, consent of the participants and uh, this is the introduction for this session and uh, this kind of lecture series will happen uh, weekly one, weekly twice or thrice depending upon my availability and depending upon the um, um, time timings okay uh, coming on to the uh, uh, before people those who are new to this uh, this lecture and I did a uh, lecture on the surgical anatomy and the pathology of the colon cancer the previous uh, video that will definitely be helpful and if anyone wants the previous video it is there in YouTube and also in the social media and you can watch that and this is the continuation of the previous lecture and anyone who wants about the pathology and the surgical anatomy and rest of the things you can view the things in the uh, youtube okay uh, today's topic coming on to the today's topic with a with a long introduction today's topic is going to be the investigation and the management of colon cancer okay what are the investigations of coming to the investigations of the colon cancer okay how are we going to uh, uh, classify this investigation of colon cancer so mainly the colon cancer uh, can the investigations to diagnose the colon cancer the investigations to stage the colon cancer and uh, the pre-operative investigations to optimize the patients so what is the confirmatory investigation for any kind of colon or rectal cancer is colonoscopy and sigmoidoscopy and with the colonoscopy and sigmoidoscopy we're going to do a tissue biopsy and next comes the after confirming the diagnosis we have to stage the disease and the staging of the disease uh, as per the nice guidelines we need to have ct thorax abdomen and pelvis and i i said about this thing why, why there is a need for thorax ct thorax in a patient who has got colonic malignancy where the where the lung meds is less common compared to the uh, liver meds the CD thorax is must still because there are chances of lower rectal cancer which gets metastasis through the systemic circulation to the lungs and also there is a chance of lumbar and vertebral metastasis in any of the colon cancer through bats and plexus of veins so CT thorax and abdomen thorax abdomen and pelvis all three are important so when it comes to liver metastasis sometimes the liver metastasis uh, uh, to assess the liver metastasis we may need triphasic ct and uh, the pet scan is helpful in this in, in this in this era to um in this era uh, especially for any patient those who come with recurrence and also mri is much more helpful for recurrence and there is a special MRI called as MRI liver, which is so helpful 
assess in the liver match when there is a dilemma between the uh, liver hemangioma or liver match so this uh, MRI liver can be helpful so apart from these investigations there are other investigations to optimize the patient before the surgery like what are the what are the general investigations like blood investigations cardiac investigations like echo ecg and the respiratory investigations like pfr and uh, the spirometries so all these things chest x-rays whatever all these things are helpful uh, for optimizing the patients so these are the anesthetic investigations okay in those investigation which i'm going to deal much more about the chronoscopy and sigmoidoscopy in detail and going on to the uh, CT and abdomen. I, I'm not going to discuss much about the CT, thorax, abdomen, pelvis. And uh, we'll see some uh, um, chat box uh, have coming up. And I would like to um, say I, I, I'm not be able to uh, I'm not be able to reply the uh, comments in the chat box. And anyone who uh, messages in the chat box definitely i'll reply it in a later time okay coming on to the um, next step and uh, so as i said you i'm going to deal about chronoscopy and sigmoidoscopy in this uh, uh, in this uh, in this lecture so this is so what, what, what when, when there is a need what are the indications of sigmoidoscopy and what are the indications for chronoscopy Okay, so the advantage of sigmoidoscopy and colonoscopy as such is uh, the sigmoidoscopy is the advantage of sigmoidoscopy is it's relatively less time consuming procedure, relatively comfortable to the patient compared to colonoscopy, and uh, it's rapid and there's no need for much of the bubble preparation. Okay, in terms of colonoscopy, it's relatively tedious process it takes some time for the chronoscopist to uh, to examine whole of the colon and definitely the bowel has to be prepped and there are some side effects of the bowel preparation i will deal about the bowel preparation for for both the surgeries and the colonoscopy in the later slides and coming on to the uh, advantages of uh, sorry disadvantage of colonoscopy again is sedation and a few uh, medications to uh, to to dilate the bowels like antispasmodics and mid complications are higher compared to sigmoidoscopy. Colonoscopy has got it higher complications, especially the bowel preparation. One in hundred, one percent of the colonoscopy, yeah, one person has got the chances of bowel perforation. And coming on to the next slide, and what are the absolute contraindication? And in um, in NHS, uh, the absolute contraindication for uh, any of the endoscopy, especially the sigmoidoscopy and colonoscopy, is the patient not willing to give consent is the most important uh, contraindication. So when the patient is not willing, don't force them to get the investigation then. And there is a, when there is a free colonic perforation, anyhow, this is absolute contraindication. What are the relative contraindications? Acute diverticulitis. In, when the patient has got acute diverticulitis, there is a weakened bubble wall which can which can perforate. So we have to check the pros and cons of doing a chronoscopy. And other 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 contraindications are post-operative patients, those who had post-operative patients, those who had bubble anastomosis, and those who are relative and other cardiac conditions like myocardial infarction, pulmonary embolism and severe coagulopathy, especially especially the patient, those who are in need of therapeutic procedures, hemodynamic instability, when the patient bleeds, parietal bleeding, and uh, wh whose, uh, whose vitals are not up to the mark. So it's a, these are the relative contraindications. And coming on to the other things, uh, the other one, one more thing is the fulminant colitis. So, and even for colitis, we do colonoscopies here to make sure whether this colitis is because of inflammatory bowel disease or because of the other causes of colitis. And coming on to the next slide. So a sigmoidoscopy is done for plenty of uh, patients and the advantage of sigmoidoscopy over the colonoscopy is 
it is used as a screening procedure screening procedure so in the previous slide i would like to say this thing as in the in this slide i didn't mention about the um i didn't mention about the uh, uh sigmatoscopy and what is the role of colonoscopy when the patient has got a sigmatoscopy when there are two or more tubular adenomas a large adenoma or a tubular villus adenoma then the colonoscopy is important the colonoscopy is done and uh, the patient go and the patient okay for example if the patient has got a uh, sigmoidoscopy and they find two or more tubular adenomas or large adenoma or a tubular villus adenoma these patients may need a full colonoscopy a full bowel screen all over the full to the, to the physical extent and coming on to the uh, other okay so what what exactly uh, uh, happens in sigmoidoscopy sigmoidoscopy there's a bit of difficulty in doing a sigmoidoscopy and there are loops what are the different types of sigmoid loops we come across during sigmoidoscopy so the sigmoidoscopy there are four different types of sigmoidoscopy uh, sorry uh, it's uh, sigmoid loops and uh, for which that may need they mean the sigmoidoscopy or the endoscopist may need a clockwise or an anti-clockwise tap the clockwise tap is needed for end loop which is the most common sigmoid loop and the alpha loops and the less common loops are reverse end, end, end loop and the reverse alpha loop so you could see the pictures here these are the different types of loops and these types of loops nowadays are picked up by the image 3d image uh, amplifier so when we do a sigmoidoscopy or chronoscopy we try to have a image uh, capture the image capture gives you the gives you the uh, loops or if there is a formation of loop in sigmoidoscopy or in the colonoscopy so this is the next slide so when we do a colonoscopy or sigmoidoscopy so what are the most important thing there are three important things which which is very important three important things for a successful colonoscopy are the sigmoidoscopy one is the positioning positioning of the patient helps in complete examination of the large bowel and the second is abdominal hand pressure so sometimes the patient may need or the uh, assistant may help the endoscopist to uh, to make some uh, maneuvers in the abdomen by pushing the um, by, by pushing the uh, scopes from the surface of the abdominal wall to guide the scope and the, the most important the third one is the three Three dimensional image of which which you could see in this picture on the left hand side so this three three dimensional image is really helpful when we do a chronoscopy and we can come across the types of loops whether the patient has got a loop uh, got a loop and this the scope is entering in a proper way so the first thing is the positioning any patient who has uh, uh, any um, for, a for a colonoscopy, when we are going to examine the descending colon, it's better to uh, descending colon. It is better to put the patient in right lateral position. So the ideal, uh, I, the concept behind this positioning uh, in general is keep the bowel loop hanging so that there is no pressure from the small intestine or the any of the other intra-abdominal content over the examining the over the examining part of the bowel for example if the patient if we are going to examine the left side of the colon put the patient on right lateral position and try to pass the scope so that the scope tries to scope moves smoothly and for any transverse any transverse colon examination better position is the supine position and for again ascending colon the cecum is left lateral position where the left lateral in where in this position the ascending colon hangs on the top of the abdominal wall so this is the most important thing other other things which i dis discussed are the abdominal hand pressure and the three-dimensional image image all these three all all these three things helps in position helps in 
uh, a good complete examination of the large intestine so the next thing is the withdrawal techniques the nhs is very very particular about the withdrawal technique and most of the endoscopists and the colonoscopists will definitely agree with this because uh, the withdrawal technique is very important how how rapid or how slow uh, we do the withdrawal technique helps in the adenoma detection rate it increases the adenoma de detection rate so ethnolic miss rate at colonoscopy at colonoscopy is 22% even in expert hands and especially when the polyp is less than 1 cm and the normal ideal withdrawal time must be minimum of 6 minutes and the average it should be 6 to 10 minutes any 6 to 10 minutes withdrawal time is definitely much more helpful to detect the adenomas so for any optimal examination for optimal examination techniques these are the four optimal examination techniques examining the proximal side of the flexures folds and valves for example so I'll, ex I'll explain you about the proximal size of flexures folds and valves in the next few slides and cleaning and suctioning very frequent cleaning and suctioning and adequate distension so there are, there are some there are some colonoscopies those who do uh, less gas and no or no gas colonoscopy so those things in those low gas or no gas colonoscopy there's an increased risk of miss uh, the increase there's an increased risk of uh, uh, increased risk of missing a polyp or the adenoma and adequate time of uh, weaving adequate time spent on weaving is very important so coming on to the next slide and is this this is the bowel preparation in bowel preparation i'm going to combine the bowel preparation for both colonoscopy and also for the colon surgeries so uh, i'm not going to deal separately for colonoscopy and the uh, uh, bowel preparation for colon surgeries so this is the, recom the recommended uh, the clinical guidance uh, guideline says any colonoscopy which is which is done incomplete or uh, when there is a poor visualization of the colon has to be repeated again and it should be uh, done by a more experienced colonoscopy if appropriate and never ever do a partial colonoscopy and uh, just leave it because there is a chance of high chances of missing a uh, malignancy are the polyp okay so this is another most important there's plenty of controversy going around uh, uh, asking for is the bowel preparation is must or not and and there are many studies which is happening around the world to check whether we need a bowel preparation or there is no need for bowel preparation so these are the this is this evidence is from the nice guidelines for mechanical bowel preparation without no mechanical bowel preparation so all these studies what they say is there is no evidence to say that the mechanical bowel preparation is helpful for a colonic surgery uh, is for a colonic surgery and it decreases the anastomotic leak okay so what does it mean even we give the, the anastomotic leak is same for any patient those who had the bowel preparation and those who do not have the bowel preparation and there are few surgeons still we they prefer to do a bowel preparation to make sure that to look at the site of the tumor when they when they do a surgery to differentiate between the fecal loading and also the tumor mass sometimes those who are not tattooing tattooing the tumors during the colonoscopy so in this slide you can see the anastomotic leak for low anterior resection and the anastomotic leak for colonic surgery and the combined anastomotic leak and they compare with bowel preparation with no mechanical bowel preparation so the group which had anastomotic leak in low anterior resection 8.8 .8 and 10.3 so all these things shows these evidences shows there is no much of difference in the anastomotic leak in any of the surgery any of the surgery especially low anterior resection or the colonic surgery 
mechanical power proportion or no mechanical power proportion the odds ratio are nearly 0 0.8 and 0 0.8 and 0.87 and these are almost similar and coming on to the next slide is again there is a difference between mechanical bowel preparation versus rectal enema so there are a few surgeons those who want to do a rectal enema before any rectal surgery however i'm not going to deal about the rectal surgeries in this presentation maybe the next uh, few, next presentation i will be doing a, a a presentation on rectal surgery so when this comes to again mechanical bubble preparation versus rectal enema again the anastomotic leak in both these groups are just 4.4 and compared with 3.4 there is no much of difference and so the infection rate is again almost same in both the groups so these are the these are the things which i got it from the nice guidelines uh, for the nhs Okay, what are the risks of bowel preparation? Why we are we want to avoid bowel preparation as much as possible? So the definite contraindication for any bowel preparation is presence of ileostomy and the bowel obstruction, and there are other contra contraindications like renal failure, the renal failure as a result of phosphate enema, which causes phosphate neuropathy. The incidence of phosphate neuropathy in any prep, any patient, those who have bowel preparation are one in thousand patients who have who receive sodium phosphate enema and there are other complications like hypovolemia electrolyte imbalances mainly the hypokalemia hyponatremia and hypermagnesemia these will be uh, evident with uh, the blood results and so these are the preparation plenty of preparations are available uh, around the world for bowel preparation and most commonly used in uh, NHS's movie prep and the phosphate enema and the movie prep. Uh, but ideally, a bowel preparation should be like it should not be abs absorbed and it should not stimulate the large intestine to secrete plenty of fluid, which causes hypovolemia and electrolyte imbalances. And no single agent so far is ideal uh, is ideal bowel prep and coming on to the next thing so there are two things which i said you about the uh, the movie prep and the uh, uh, phosphate enema so what happens with movie prep most commonly used is movie prep and the movie prep is not, it, it 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 is a non absorbable isoosmotic solution that means it doesn't allow it doesn't makes the intestine or the large intestine to secrete much of the fluid into the large intestine and causes diarrhea it is isoosmotic, so it just flushes away the intestinal lumen. The problem with this movie prep is we have to take it with plenty of water, and the patient has to be drinking a lot of loads and loads of water to for the bowel preparation. So initially they give two to three liters of water prior to the night of the procedure, and again one to two liters just in the morning. And in the sodium phosphate preparation, the advantage of sodium phosphate preparation is. The 45 mil, 40 mil, 45 mils of preparation is mixed with the 1, 1 to 1.8 liters of water, and it's adjusted in the same way like that of the uh, uh, like that of the prep. And uh, the advantage, the the disadvantage of phosphate enema, as I said, you is one is uh, phosphate nephropathy, and the other thing is it causes hyperosmotic and promote colonic eva eva evacuation by drawing large volume of water into the colon so that means it secre it, it stimulates the colonic mucosa to secrete plenty of fluid into the colon and causes uh, and helps in the uh, bowel preparation the most important thing the advice this most important advice uh, which is in, uh, which, which we give to the patient are uh, the dietary restrictions low residual diet are uh, in other terms less of fiber diet prior to the procedure helps the patient uh, to clean the uh, to clean the intestines as much as possible because some most of the time we could we, can, we come across um, poor bowel preparation because of the fiber diet the so low residual diet 24 hours prior to the colonoscopy will be helpful for a clear visualization of the intestines so other medications which are used for the best colonoscopy and best results are buscopan but the, however the buscopan as is as everyone knows it causes it's an antispasmodic 
slight dilatation of the smooth molecular relaxation of the large intestine causes clear visualization of the intestines and there is a risk of sinus tachycardia. Other antispirotic plasmodics which can be used are glucagon. I'm not sure about this thing. And the other most important thing is those who are those who, uh, those who have contraindication for buscopan can use warm water irrigation and that can be sometimes helpful. The routine use of the buscopan, rate of flexion and the minimum withdrawal time can improve global adenoma detection rate. So ADA is nothing but the adenoma detection rate. So these three are uh, recommended by the NHS as guidelines for best colonoscopic results. Okay, what are the newer techniques in the endoscope, endoscopic mucosal and visualization? So to avoid to increase the adenoma detection rate, so these are the three things which are helpful, the cups, caps and rings. The cups, cups, caps and rings, I have not used it uh, here, I have not used it. And they say that these three things helps in the detection of, uh, increased detection of the uh, adenomas. And this next one is the 360 degree weaving scopes. The 360 degree weaving scopes again helps in the visualization of the, so this is this is the 360 degree uh, chronoscope. The first picture shows the uh, the four cameras, the tip of the telescope, tip of the telescope, and there are plenty of lights around it. And there's a video here which I can run it for you guys. And this video shows the three three dimensional. Uh, I got this from from the San Siso, San um, uh, website, and this is a 360 degree uh, telescope telescope are uh, the 360 degree endoscope where we can see um, four cameras one in the right and left and then one the top and bottom you can see this here one right side and the left the top and the bottom camera and there are 360 degree visualization and integrated viewing of the camera probably the future of the colonoscopy will be the 360 degree cameras so it helps in the diagnosis of the missed polyps and mist and diverticulum are plenty of things. And I'd like to stop this video here, much, not much. And you can see these things in the internet if you are interested. So the next thing is the chromo endoscopy. So chromo endoscopy, in chromo endoscopy, we use indigo common dye to enhance the adenoma or the mucosal surface to, for the detection of adenoma. The narrow beam, narrow beam, narrow, narrow band imaging, which I have used in the laparoscopy for plenty of gyne gynecologists use this thing in the laparoscopy, even in uh, endoscopy, to uh, enhance the submucosal uh, vascularity. So this enhances the submucosal vascularity and clear, clear visualization of the vasculatures of the adenomas and uh, the. Uh, Confocal laser micro uh, endo microscopy and video endoscope. I'm not used this, and so I cannot comment about this. There's I, there's something called as eye scan. There are different three degrees of eye scan, which uh, each which the recent endoscopy uh, instruments comes with, and these are very helpful for detection of uh, any dysplasia. Especially, it's helpful in apogee endoscopy uh, to for the detection of Barrett's esophagus. So when it comes to the next most important advances is high magnification endoscopy. It magnifies 100 times and this high magnification endoscopy helps in the detection of peak patterns of the uh, peak patterns of the polyps. So these are the five different tips, uh, five different peak patterns of the polyps. So type one and type two are almost usually it's, uh, it's a benign thing. And this can correlate with the Thing which I said even in the last lecture, the aberrant crypt foci. The type 1 and type 2 are round pits and stellate pits, which are normal and uh, hyperplastic, and the rest of the things are 3, 4, and 5. 3, 4, and 5 are mostly adenoma, and it can be cancerous. In, in any of the cancer, pit pattern is irregular and non structured, and if it is uh, uh, long tubular or roundish pits, it could be adenoma, it can be long tubular or small tubular. There are pits which are dry, sulk with gyrus and sulcus, it can be because of adenoma or villus adenoma.
So coming on to the basic endo endoscopic therapies, poly polypectomies, less than four mm of poly polyps can be uh, can be treated by cold cold snares or just cold forceps, and probably more than four mm may need hard snares or other other modes of uh, endoscopic therapy. Endoscopic mucosal resection. The most important thing when we do the endoscopic mucosal resection is non-lifting sign. The non-lifting sign is nothing but we lift the mucosal surface of during the endoscopy to to remove the polyp. So when the mucosal surface of the stock is not able to be lifted up, so that means there is a chance of infiltration of the polyp into the submucosa. So the non-lifting sign is a contraindication for endoscopic mucosal resection. Tattooing in colonoscopy. So this is most important in and in, in, it can be in colonoscopy or sigmoidoscopy. The tattooing is very important to make sure that what is the site of the malignancy and when the, uh, the when, when the surgeon operates it helps in the margins and the resection and the length of the resection and the vessel pedicle okay what are the indications uh, any uh, indications for tattooing so any any patient those who are planned for surgery and any patient those who are planned for follow-up of the polyps needs tattooing and they, uh, most of the most the rectal they don't tattoo the rectal lesions and also cecal lesions sometimes and the reason is it disrupts the surgical plane and we are not able to, we cannot be uh, going the right plane when we tattoo the rectal lesion because the tattoo gets dispersed around to the surrounding tissue and uh, causes the planes causes the misassumption of the planes so what are the equipments usually it is done by the varicell injection needle and uh, the thing which is used for tattoo tattooing is black indian ink and uh, one ml or 0.9 ml of steril uh, sterilized black indian ink is mixed with five ml of normal saline for the time so how, how the tattooing is done usually when we do the colonoscopy just be raised the mucosa and distal to the always the tattooing is done distal to the lesion first thing the distal to the lesion and three sides are preferred one uh, all three sides should be at least 120 degree apart and you can see the picture here in this third one 20 degree apart with the lesion in the middle and distal to the sorry lesion in the middle and distal to the uh, distal to the lesion we see we do the tattooing so lift the mucosa inject one ml one or two two ml of saline mix uh, in, inject the tattoo aspirate the tattoo again back and leave the uh, uh, leave the saline so these are the this is the procedure how we do the tattooing tattooing really helps in patient uh, who and patient who's planned for surgery and this tattoo lasts for at least one year so there are plenty of studies there's something called a spot study if i'm not wrong the spot study has has seen the length of availability of the uh, length of availability of the tattooing so uh, the tattoo stays uh, for yeah it's a, a, a spot study the spot study uh, shows that the tattoo stays there for at least one year so hopefully i think this will help any of the surgeon those who are uh, worried about the tattooing uh, during the surgery so the next slide is the advanced endoscopic therapist and the endoscopic therapist. So these are the advanced procedures. So as everyone knows, the initial management of any valvulus is colonoscopic or the sigmoidoscopic decompression. So usually, the first management of any valvulus is endoscopic decompressions. The emergency surgery for valvulus is when the patient has got ischemic bubble or the patient is sepsis or the patient has got peritonitis due to perforation so all these three things are indication for the emergency surgery in valvulus the other indication for colonoscopic decompression is the pseudo obstruction or called as it's called as ogilvy syndrome and again the ogilvy syndrome the colonoscopic decompression as the last before entity usually it is managed conservatively three to four days if not the patient has gets prescribed with neostigmine. Most of the time, the conservative management, the neostigmine helps the patient. If anyone wants dose of the neostigmine, they can they can contact the ITU or the anesthetic registrar. They will definitely help you. And the endoscopic decompression. 
endoscopic decompression then comes into the role. And if the patient has got, again, uh, repeated attacks of uh, pseudo obstruction, the patient can do from 30 in case of cooperation and ischemia. The other uh, advances in the endoscopic therapies are endoscopic submucosal dissection and stricture dilatation taser and uh, endoscopic full thickness resection techniques. I'm not sure about how these techniques are done and all those things, but the stricture and dilatation, stricture dilatation and stenting is very important, more commonly, most commonly done in NHS for any patient, those who have left-sided tumor uh, are the left uh, sigmoid uh, obstruction or rectal sigmoid obstruction due to malignancy to they do a strict dilatation and stenting to avoid emergency surgery provided the patient is not having any sepsis of operation or ischemia of the bowel. So these are the, uh, okay, coming on to the next illustration, I think I've dealt with the colonoscopy and sigmoidoscopy in, in detail and that the procedure as such uh, can be seen in uh, in any of the uh, videos in YouTube, plenty of videos are available for colonoscopy and sigmoidoscopy. So coming on to the next thing is the CT colonography or virtual colonoscopy. So this is a new invention or this is a new thing which is radiologist in the, in the department of radiology. Sensitivity for detecting large polyps in a virtual colonoscopy or CT colonography or CTC is around 90 to 96% 90 to 96%. Okay. Uh, most of the elderly patients, they come, they, they go for sigmoidoscopy and they're not able to, if the sigmoidoscopy or the colonoscopy is not, the patient doesn't tolerate after after we cross the hepatic flexure or after, sorry, after we cross the sigmoid flexure or if we, uh, after we cross the sigmoid, the procedure can be abandoned and the patient can be subjected for CTC. Uh, when the patient is just fit for sigmoidoscopy, we do a sigmoidoscopy following which we do a CT chronography. So the CT chronography is, advantage of CT chronography is it's non-invasive. The patient is put under the scanner and we do, we, we get the images and we diagnose the possibility of right-sided or the hepatic flexure growth of uh, the tumor. And the most important disadvantage of the CTC or CT chronography is will not have a tissue biopsy, will not have a, uh, will not be able to get an biopsy, get a biopsy from the CTC. The next other advantage is self-propelling colonoscopes, and these are the balloons which is that which are that in the self-propelling propelling colonoscopes. So this self-propelling colonoscopes is not in much of use and I, I, I've not done it and I've not seen it. So I can't much comment about this thing, but this is one of the advanced, advances in the large bowel investigation. And the next is capsule endoscopy, which is used much, much more in the small intestine. And sometimes there is a chance of using it, I, I'm not sure how how far it is used uh, in colonoscopy, but there's something called as uh, Pilcam colon 2, which is capsule endoscopy for the colons. Those who are, those who don't know how, how they use the endoscope, uh, um, uh, capsule endoscopy, the, what happens is the patient comes with bowel preparation on the day of the procedure, the patient swallows the capsule and there is a transducer which is, uh, which is tied around the belt, around the waist or the abdomen and the patient goes home. The patient has got 24 hours and the capsule moves around, moves and captures whole of the intestinal uh, lumen and it records the image and the patient comes back with the, uh, with the receiver and the pill cam. The patient passes the pill cam uh, in the stool and it's reused and this this um, receiver uh, helps in the detection. Uh, we can get the images from the receiver. So this is how the uh, capsule endoscopy uh, scan. Okay, what about the com next comes is the bubble cancer screening program. So the newer invention of the bubble cancer screening program is FIT test or fecal immunochemical testing. The fecal immunochemical testing, the advantage of fecal immunochemical testing with the Fecal occult blood testing, or GOIC fecal occult blood testing is the sensitivity. The FIT test 
can pick up the low concentration of blood even 0 0.2 0 0.02 milligram of hemoglobin per gram of feces compared to if compared to the regular fecal blood testing where 0 0.6 milligram of hemoglobin is needed per gram of feces to detect the and this uh, fit test is replacing the uh, occult blood test in the future uh, um, in the NHS uh, in the past one or two years uh, NHS England and NHS Wales have already implemented this fit test in the screening program in, at the level of the GPs and uh, the other thing is any patient those who have those who cross more than 75 years of age can request for screening kit and they can uh, they can get get it again they can get the endoscopy or colonoscopy done and the other thing is the years of age any patient those who have those who are more than 50 years of age again with some uh from a, with some previous history of colonic uh, colonic malignancy in the family can request for them um, uh colonoscopy or the investigations so I'm, I'm not going in detail about the bowel cancer screening program which the GPs or the, the primary care physicians takes into uh, takes into consideration and uh, comes coming on to the next thing is the uh, uh, personal embryonic antigen CEA the use of CEA is um, is not that important uh, in uh, in any of the GI cancers it's because uh, any adenocarcinoma is going to produce CEA and that can be synchronous or metachronous lesion producing plenty of CEAs and that's and it has got low predictive values. The other tumor markers for chronic malignancies are circulating microRNAs and circulating methylated septin. Circulated methylated septin is just approved by the FDA and it's for screening in USA and the NHS doesn't uh, use this. And the other thing is the microRNAs and even we don't use the microRNA, circulating microRNAs, and these are the other tumor markers which can be helpful for the uh, tumor markers which can be helpful for lack of malignancies. Okay, and the next part of the lecture is the surgery for colon cancer, and I'm not going to deal about the surgery for rectal cancer and the uh, it, it will be dealt in one on another session and in this session we we'll just deal about the principles of colonic cancer malignancies and i'm not going to deal about the steps and procedures of the surgery and i'm just going to deal about the principles of colonic surgery so that means so what are the steps what are the uh, things which we have to be keeping in mind when we do a uh, large bowel resection for a colonic malignancy and uh, the most important thing in this present era is the enhanced recovery after surgery protocol or it's called as eras protocol and there are plenty of era pro protocol for different surgeries colorectal upper gi bariatric uh, hbb pancreatic so there are plenty of protocols for different types of uh, uh, surgeries and there are Something called as ERAS gynecological procedures. So, what exactly ERAS means? So, the previous concepts of starving the patients, doing bowel preparation, keep yeah, stressing the patient with plenty of pre op, you know, pre -op procedures, saying that we prepare the patient for surgery are minimized, and it is evidence based saying that all these things has no role in any of the surgeries for example so the eras has got three components pre-operative intraoperative and post-operative pre-operative the chronic any 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 patient those who have colorectal surgeries in the pre-operative pre operative period they get pre-admission counseling which i felt personally which i felt like pre-admission counseling helps much 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 in the preparation of the mind for the patient and helps the post-operative is really good and for fluid and carbohydrate loading example example like 200 mils of carbohydrate 200 uh, ml of carbohydrate drink two hours prior to the surgery is definitely helpful for any kind of surgery even for even for colorectal surgery and there's no need for prolonged fasting no no selective no uh, selective bowel preparation few surgeons they need a small preparation just before the surgery to make sure that they don't have the fecal, fecal pieces which mimics the tumor 
and uh, antibiotic prophylaxis, especially the antibiotics are given either just before the incision, if it is intravenous root, or 30 minutes before the uh, incision, if it is oral root, and uh, uh, most of the time it's a single dose of antibiotic prophylaxis. Prophylaxis is more than sufficient and uh, really prophylaxis and no pre medication. That's actually, there is something called as uh, NSAIDs two hours prior to the NSAIDs two hours prior to the uh, uh, procedure. Uh, I, uh, it's evidence based saying that I, 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 I saw something in the update that comes saying the NSAIDs helps in reducing the post-operative pain if it is given pre-operatively. So what are the things which we have to concentrate on eras in intraoperative? There's something called as good analgesics, short-term anesthetic agents, and epidural anesthesia for pain relief, and try to use less of drain, and and it's called a zero balance fluid, zero, zero, zero balance fluid, like the intake and output during the surgery has to be maintained by the anesthetist and maintenance of normal normal temperature throughout the duration of the procedure and keep the surgery as less as possible like try to use minimal invasive surgery wherever it is possible and that's the these are the protocols these are the things which helps in eras and post-operatively the pain, pain control it's very important for any patient those who are under eras program and try to uh, take off the try to take off the uh, tubes as early as possible, like NG drains and uh, uh, all the tubes, catheters, all the tubes out as as early as possible, which can help the which can help the patient to come out of the surgery as early as possible. Okay, coming on to the next slide. So these are the things which I wanted to in, uh, emphasize before elective surgery. Uh, the things, what are the things which have to do, which we have to do before any elective colorectal surgery is confirm this, confirm the CT scan, CT with thorax and abdomen. Make sure that the patient is discussed in MDT, and patient make sure that the uh, histology is available and the location of the tumor is perfectly tattooed and try to avoid as much as possible, try to avoid mechanical bowel perforation as much as possible until otherwise needed VT prophylaxis. And in terms of blood transfusion, group and save and the trans matching is needed, it's highly unlikely to transfuse a patient who has a, a, a colon resection. And the ideal, thing, ideal hemoglobin, which is needed for perfect healing of a patient who undergoes colonic malignancy is 70 to 80 grams per liter is more than sufficient. So it has to be weighed with the comorbids. For example, if the patient has got uh, anemia with failure or any previous anemia with failure or any patient who has got cardiac condition, we have to make sure the hemoglobin is around 80 to, 90, uh, 80 to 90 or 100. And if the patient is perfectly fine, no comorbids, nothing, and hemoglobin level of 70 to 80 is still considered a good hemoglobin level for a preoperative patient who those who have even major surgeries and preoperative oral iron therapy can boost up the iron hemoglobin. Coming on to the uh, next is antibiotic prophylaxis, which I led already. And the next slide is the principles of surgery. Okay, so this is what the this goal of the management of the colonic surgery is going to be. So what are the principles of colonic surgery when the patient has got colon cancer? So dissection in the embryologically defined mesocolic plane, uh, it is called as complete mesocolic excision. So try to be precise in your, vas in your, in, in your plane. The second thing is central ligation of vascular pedicle. So try to ligate the pedicle as much as possible. Flash ligation or one centimeter from the Ligation. I will discuss each and everything in detail in the next few slides. And the resection of an adequate length of colon on either side of the tumor. So how much margin of the tumor or the proximal length or the distal length has to be taken into account when we do a colonic resection. So this is called as there's something called as colon related survival is defined as a survival from post-operative death, whether from recurrence or 
post-operative complications, including re-operation to the five-year survival of 89.1% after resection in stage one to three patients. Okay, I'll come, I'll come to these things. I think I discussed about the stage uh, stages of the colonic cancer in the previous lecture, and uh, this is going to be uh, uh, this is going to be investigation management lecture. So this five-year survival rate of 89.1% is overall for one to three. It's not for just stage three patient. And there's a German surgeon who has given this from his experience who did D3 dissection. So there was a question in the last lecture uh, regarding the types of dissection in the uh, in the colon cancer, which will be dead in the uh, next few slides. So, as I said you already, the complete mesocolic excision is the is the aim of the any colon malignancy surgery. The complete mesocolic excision aims. What are the aims of complete mesocolic excision? Is removal of the in, removal of the mesentery along with the bowel and potentially involved lymph nodes associated with colonic cancer which reduces the chance of leaving a disease. And this is called as complete mesocolic excision. So what is micrometastasis? Sometimes what happens is the tumor deposits less than two mm, which cannot be palpated by, even when we do any laparoscopic procedure, even when we do the open procedure, which cannot be easily palpated, the tumor deposits less than two mm in diameter. So even that has to be taken off to make sure that we give R0 resection. And the isolated tumor cells are should be these and the isolated tumor cells which are identified in this specimen during the pathology, like 0.2 mm diameter. So, what is skip metastasis? Skip metastasis, for example, there is a last in the last the last lecture I this I I explained about the levels of lymph nodes like epicolic nodes, paracolic nodes, intermediate nodes, and the nodes along the vascular pedicle. So there are one to two percent of patients with colonic malignancies which who's got skip metastasis for example the epicolic nodes will be involved and the intermediate cold nodes will be skipped and the uh, vascular the, the the other nodes which are around the vascular particles may be involved so there are one to two percent chances of skip metastasis so coming on to the central central vessel ligation so which is the second part of the uh, second part of the uh, principles of surgery in colonic uh, malignancy inspection. So the flush ligation of, uh, it's, it's not SMA, sorry, I think I, I made a mistake. It's not SMA, it's flush ligation of inferior mesenteric artery are the branches of, are the branches of SMA. So what happens with the flush ligation? So when we do a flush ligation in, in the sense, ligate one centimeter from the origin of the IMA are the branches of the SMA. What happens when we, when we do this? We try to remove as much as nodes possible when we do this ligation, one setting from the origin of any of the major vessels which supplies the uh, region of the malignancy. So the next thing is when we do a flush, lig flush ligation, it avoids um, this ligation of one centimeter from the origin, it avoids damage to the hypoplastic plexus, which minimizes the urinary and sexual dysfunctions in uh, if it is, I if it is uh, IMA and if it is uh, the branches of the SMA, we avoid the risk of severe diarrhea postoperatively. So there was a discussion, as I said, you, there was something someone was interested in knowing that what are the types of dissection, uh, the uh, D1 and D2 and D3 dissections. So when the patient uh, gets the, gets removed, the, just the pericolic, or paracolic and epicolic nodes, it goes for D1 dissection. When the intermediate link nodes are removed, it becomes the D2 dissection. And when the central nodes or the apical nodes from the origin of the blood vessels, they, it comes the uh, D3 dissection. So these are the three types of dissections. These are the three types of dissection which are helpful in the colonic uh, malignancy. And the next picture, which is that here, in the left-hand side shows the types of dissection. For example, there's a sigmoid tumor. And in this tumor, the two other vessels are left out that means the vessels on the top and the vessels on the bottom is left out so in this in this three in, in this 
we are missing the other bit, other nodes around the intermediate nodes. We are missing the intermediate nodes, and this can go for when we remove the intermediate nodes, it becomes the T2 dissection. And when we go to the uh, origin of the blood vessel, especially like flush ligation of IMA, it becomes the D3 dissection. And there's a German surgeon who has found out he 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 was he was doing D3 dissection for any kind of malignancy except for T1 uh, T1 tumor, and he found out that's the that's the reason he found out the survival rate is very high. But he has got a he had a plenty of complications because of D3 dissection. So these controversies I, I'll deal about these controversies in the next few slides. Okay, so this is the plane and the levels of lymph node dissection which we dealt about like d1 d2 and d3 are the levels of the dissections what has to be removed for a perfect complete mesopolic excision and when it comes to the extent of longitudinal resection and uh, there are plenty of i would like to uh, uh, in stress at another point here there are plenty of research saying that d3 dissection d2 dissection there's no advantage disadvantage and these things are in the recent uh, uh, recent edition from the specialist finance series for the special specialty the uh, special specialist surgery. So I would like to say these are the recent things, and there are four evidences which is uh, which is given in the nice guidelines to follow all these things. So uh, I don't want to discuss about plenty of things in the, about the dissections and the advantages of. Yeah, many dissections the things which i have discussed right now is from the recent uh, editions of the uh, nhs uk books okay uh, coming on to the longitudinal resection so how long the resection has to be so this is very important the lymphatic flow is towards the nearest feeding vessel or the main vessel make sure that you check the feeding vessel or the nearest main vessel near to the colonic lesion or colonic malignancy. Lesion has a clear main vessel. For example, the patient, the, the, the tumor has got a clear main vessel, five centimeter past that main vessel and 10 centimeter past the, past the tumor in the opposite direction. Okay, for example, it's, it's in the proximal and the distal. Okay, proximal is 10 and the distal is five. And the tumor is directly opposite to the, the tumor is directly opposite to the main vessel resection is, uh, for 10 centimeter. Okay, I'll explain you in the next next slide with the picture so that it will be easy to understand. So this is the picture. So when there's a tumor in the head pass clinic fracture, the two blood vessels which are proximal and distal are identified, and five centimeter proximal and five centimeter distal to the uh, distal to the feeding vessels which supplies this tumor in the sigmoid colon. Is the resection margin so these are the new concept which um, which uh, from the recent books okay when it comes to the sickle coma sickle tumor again we are going to do a right hemicolectomy so how far this is going to be the so the right hemicolectomy it should be like the the feeding vessel and the again 5 10 centimeter and again in the next thing if there is a tumor in the there's a tumor in the okay if there is a tumor in the left, uh, sorry, hepatic flexure, the nearest main vessel which supplies the hepatic flexure has to be identified and five centimeter distal to the uh, uh, distal to the feeding vessel uh, is taken as the margin for resection. Okay, when we come. When we take this thing into the consideration, we come across plenty of vascular variations of the colon. And in this, we could see plenty of variation. In the first picture, we could see the accessory artery of the transverse colon, uh, uh, which, which, which comes from the uh, SMA again. And there is a single middle colic artery dividing it two or two to three centimeters, and that which supplies the right and the transverse colon. In the second picture, we could see the uh, uh, the artery which supplies the angle of the uh, angle of the colon or right hepatic colon. So when 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 we come across these uh, kinds of variation, the concept which again we we have to take is the 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 main vessel which feeds the tumor and five centimeter post 
vessel and 10 centimeter pre pre vessel. So try to use this concept for the uh, for the complete mesocolic excision are the central sorry for the central uh, uh, vessel vascular ligation. So these are the other uh, variations, the venous, uh, uh, venous, ana venous anatomy of during the dissection. And I don't want to get into this thing uh, much. And the next slide, okay, what are the controversies? So when, when, when it comes to controversies of the dissection, the most important thing is the D3 dissection, this D3 dissection as opposed to standard D3 dissection. So what happens is the plenty of the, plenty of uh, uh, colorectal surgeons they, th they think the D3 dissection has got a very good uh, prognosis, uh, leaving less of tumor cells in the field. And uh, but the uh, complication as such is really comparatively high in D3 dissection. This important study, which is taken based in Copenhagen, which shows the colonic cancer resection should proceed with the within the mesocolic plane in order to improve cancer outcomes. The, special, the specimen should be included intermediate lymph nodes at least and the oncological benefit from the nodal resection. The surgeon is confident of performing PVL or vascular ligation, complete central vascular ligation without morbidity into main nodes may improve the results. So definitely the D3 dissection, it has been proven that D3 dissection has got good prognosis. So what is the practical guidance also guidance for extent of resection? Okay, practically we can talk about the resections. The right hemicolectomy for any tumor involving the system, right colon, right transverse colon, extended right hemicolectomy okay, is accompanied with greater morbidity, and uh, you have to think about this thing. We do the resection, transverse colectomy in, in the situation if the middle colic actually is bisected at the level of its margin, and uh, when the patient in the tumor is present in the sigmoid flexure. Uh, segmental left colectomy or the left hemic hemicolectomy uh, is useful in left colon cancer distal to the ascending left um, distal to the ascending left colic artery. Okay, so in this era of laparoscopic surgery, we have to think about which is better and which is like as, as laparoscopic procedures got better oncological outcomes are the open procedure. So it has been def it has been demonstrated with evidence saying that the best outcome, there's nothing called as best outcome in both, both the procedures. The oncological outcome is same with both laparoscopic and the open procedure provided the laparoscopic procedure is done in a perfect way, as I said, you like CME, complete mesocolic excision. And even it comes to the uh, advantage of laparoscopy versus open procedure, it helps in the errors management. Minimally invasive patient tries to come out of the bed as early as possible, and the discharge is discharge happens in four to five days, in an average in any of the colon cancer resection, and five to six days in any of the rectal cancer resection. Which uh, the, there's, a, there's a trial called as LAPA trial which shows there's a decreased incision hernia rates in laparoscopic procedure and the addition, decreased addition rates in laparoscopic procedure compared to the open procedure. What are the things uh, we have to, we can, we can be helpful in the laparoscopic colonic resection, which can, patient is obese, what are the things which can, can be helpful. So try to position the table 30 degrees, 20 degrees, right? Uh, Head up, uh, sorry, head down, sorry, head down, and uh, right up if it is laparoscopic hemicolectomy, if it is uh, left hemicolectomy, try to decide which is which we are going to operate on. And extra ports, extra five mm ports is definitely going to help. Uh, and extra hand, sometimes we may, we may need even a hand port or separate hand port to help to mobilize the colon or mobilize the uh, to retract the intestines. Uh, and uh, these are the few things. This, this is just an additional information. So, next, anastomotic leaks and the leakage due to any chronic surgeries. How are we going to? How are we going to diagnose it? How are we going to manage it? So, in the era of eras, in the era, in as per the eras protocol, 
most of the time the tubes are out in first day or second day and the patient starts working in second day uh, sometimes even first day or uh, first day and that we remove everything so the patient opens the bubble in second day or third day in um, uh, in any of the colonic surgeries okay how are we going to diagnose the anastomotic leakage so the anastomotic leakage so many people have got different ideas about diagnosing and uh, diagnosing an uh, anastomotic leakage like pulse rate and crp and other symptoms and all these things are definitely important any patient who is uh, who has got tachycardia insignificant tachycardia without any uh, with, the, with the abdominal symptoms um, try to uh, try to think about anastomotic leak and when the crp goes more than 200 try to think about anastomotic leak when the crp is increasing rapidly without any other signs of uh, uh, sepsis like ever sepsis or even a tract infection or pneumonia you know, try to think about anastomotic leak and in the most important thing is we in the eras protocol we don't wait for the bowel sounds or the bowel movements to appear or things to start the feeding so we start on clear fluids as early as possible uh, even immediately after surgery like people they start taking this we, we, we uh, as the clear have a clear set of fluid even after surgery, immediately after surgery so the most important investigation to, uh, uh, to diagnose the anastomotic leakage is the CT chest or the abdomen. CT chest, abdomen, pelvis. The C why can I? What is the reason for CT chest? Just to rule out any other cause of chest infection, which can, which can lead on to the, which which can lead on to the, which can which we have to think about uh, like pneumonia and things. And. Uh, Few radiologists, those who are really damn brave enough, can do a rectal enema, a rectal contrast enema to check for leak in the, uh, in the lower rectal uh, lesions or the lower rectal uh, colonic cancers. As otherwise, treatment of anastomotic leakage is again antibiotics and try to do a loop upstream defunctioning loop stoma as early as possible if you think of. Uh, uh, if you think of anastomotic leak, proctoscope to evacuate the effluents as much as possible. And leave the drain as leave the drains adjacent to the anastomosis. Do not remove the drain, which is helpful for the, which is definitely helpful for the drain to uh, function. And uh, when we when you so what are the when when can we think about high risk of leakage when we uh, high risk of leakage uh, during the surgery or preoperatively. Uh, any patient who has got male six and the ASA of the ASA of grade two or more with plenty of comorbids, and uh, the patient who had radiotherapy uh, with tumor size more than three centimeters, all these things are chances of leak are high in these patients. And uh, patient those who are immunosuppressants and those who are on um, other medications. Coming on to the emergency management of how what are the principles of management of patients who have colonic malignancy and who present to the emergency AE. So any patient uh, who comes to AE with um, colonic malignancy and with any kind of uh, emergency management like obstruction or perforation or uh, 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 peritonitis. Has got increased mortality when doing surgery in uh, as an emergency. Though, uh, though it's uh, uh, when it is done as an elective, there's a decreased uh, mortality and morbidity. And there, there are twenty percent of patients with colonic cancer present as an emergency, sixty percent present with obstruction. So the most important thing which we have to think about is 60, 16 percent of the patient uh, uh, presents in the A &E as obstruction and most of the time the obstruction is from because of the left-sided colon cancer and perforation occurs but it is rare and if it happens it occurs mostly in the cecum because of the left-sided uh, colonic obstruction bleeding perforations are less common modes of emergency presentation in any uh, with the colonic malignancies so the next slide is 
regarding the obstruction, how are we going to deal with the obstruction, CT scan picks up the obstruction, any uh, patient has got sickle diameter of more than 12, he needs uh, immediate intervention as early as possible, sometimes uh, a needle aspiration of, uh, uh, of sorry. Uh, so try to resuscitate the patient when the patient is uh, uh, obstructed. Try to resuscitate the patient immediately and plan for emergency surgery. What surgery you are going to do for this patient when there is an obstruction? Uh, try to avoid any resections and anastomosis when the patient has got peritonitis and plenty of soiling. And try to anastomose anastomos resection anastomos there is a less chance of soiling there is a less soiling or small amount of soiling and in terms of uh, obstruction and the uh, in, when there is an obstruction there is a need for intraoperative uh, cleaning of the large intestine to make sure that the intestines are uh, easily resectable, uh, especially when there is a, when there is a sickle, sickle diameter of 12 centimeter and large bowel obstruction with huge colon. We may be having difficulty in uh, uh, mobilizing the colon and dissecting the colon. In that scenario, we can do an on-table colonic irrigation. So uh, in this picture, you can see there is a sequestrum which is done with a sign pushed into it. And when there's a tumor in the left side, we can do a on-table colonic irrigation uh, using um, uh, anesthetic tubes, something like that. So this is one other way to make the surgery easy, uh, to mobilize the colon so that it will be easy for the resection. Oh, uh, another principle is any grass in top abdominal substance, as I said, you safer not to anastomose, exteriorize the proximal bubble. And if the patient is fit enough and there is no signs of peritonitis or perforation, if it is left colonic obstruction, try to stent the tumor if it is possible. And stenting helps the patient to relieve the obstruction and try to take up this patient to the surgery. In, in 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 at least two weeks, and this improves the and this improves the uh, morbidity and mortality of the patient. So when there is a perforation, okay, uh, when there is a perforation, resect the tumor, and there is a question like whether we have to do a uh, uh, whether we have to do a stigma uh, sumeroscopy or colonoscopy post procedure. Yes, sometimes we resect the tumor. There's a chance of diverticular perforation around the uh, around the tumor mass, and which may, which may be which may be thinking that uh, our diverti uh, uh, our diverticulitis is hiding the uh, tumor things. So it's better to do a, a colonoscopy when we do a uh, when we do a resection than after uh, the procedure. It's better to do a screening test screening scopes and uh, so as i said earlier any patient who who has perforated uh, large intestine due to colon cancer uh, do a resection and if the contamination is if the contamination is uh, not that much if it is less contaminated we can anastomose you can do a reconstruction if it is really advisable get the opinion if it is needed so this is the last slide, and there are plenty of uh, this is uh, uh, this is the website which gives a clear video about the complete mesopolic excision which we dealt here, and the steps and the laparoscopic procedure. The steps of all the uh, CME is explained in this video. I've just put up the um, just the name of this site. Uh, St. Mark's Academic Institute that was that okay. gives you a clear um, uh, so all the procedures, not only right in the you can see any of the colonic surgeries. Okay, this is the last slide, and which I missed in the previous lecture. So, in the previous lecture, I said about the prevention of the uh, uh, colonic malignancies by NSADs here in, in, in NHS. 
I, I came across this thing uh, in the NICE guidelines saying that you consider aspirin for two years or uh, more than two years, the patient is prone for Lynch syndrome. So, so just to add up to the previous uh, uh, lecture. So this comes to the end of the session and I have not dealt about the surgeries for rectum and the steps of the different procedures like right hemicolectomy, left hem hemicolectomy, or segmental sigmoidectomy. I can take this as an another session, which are the procedures of procedures are the steps in the uh, colon with a video or without a video. And this comes to the end. And I'm going to open the um, for discussion. I can uh, open up uh, the audio if anyone is interested for interested in. Questions and answer session. Can ask. I'll open up the you can ask unmute. unmute. If anyone wants to ask, they can unmute and they can go for the question and answer session. Like any discussion can be done now. And there are five chat commands which I can try to have a look. How do we get the previous topics on YouTube? Just go and search Dr. Varun uh, Arunagiri at uh, in the YouTube. And I think probably you should uh, get it done. And link in YouTube, please. Sure, um, uh, we'll do a. Uh, I think it should be available in YouTube. I think if I'm not wrong, it should be uh, available in the YouTube. And anyone can unmute if they want to ask anything or to come for the discussion. Hello, hello, Dr. Warren. How are you? Uh, uh, can you I, I would like you guys to introduce yourself so that I can, uh, um, I can. Uh, I, I'm, I'm Dr. Nasir, general surgeon from Pakistan. I have a question. Uh, please explain the low anterior section, anterior section, and ultra low. Uh, yeah, I, I, as I said, you, I, I have not dealt anything about the rectal cancer, and uh, these are the principles okay. of colonic malignancy. As I said, you, I may deal about the rectal cancer this another session. Where comes the uh, low anterior and the, all the anterior sections? Okay, okay, thank you. Hi, Varun, can you hear me? Yes, um, yes, please. Hi, this is Arun. I'm, uh, I'm one of the surgeons in Manchester Royal. Uh, it, I must congratulate you. I must congratulate you on your wonderful presentations. There was a bit yeah. of background noise. I'm sure that is something beyond your control. I don't know. I don't know. I think I, I'm in a silent room. I think uh, let me try to uh, rectify this next time. If we try to know what's the reason, right? My 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 question uh, my question is that uh, uh, colorectal primary with a synchronous uh, colorectal mets and liver. What should be the approach, primary or the metastasis first, or both together? Okay. Usually, uh, what happens in NHS, as we know, like uh, if, when it comes to the liver meds. It goes to, there's something called as advanced MDT, like advanced cancer MDT. And uh, there will be a team of uh, liver, uh, liver surgeons. It depends again on the liver meds. Like for example, if it is a resectable liver meds, uh, they plan for a simultaneous uh, resection of the liver meds. And uh, this, is, uh, this, this is from uh, actually, this is, it, it, they do it simultaneously. 
simultaneous resection of the primary with the simultaneous resection of the liver mats if it is resectable. And if it is non resectable, uh, probably I think uh, the MDT has to approach in a different way like chemotherapy, chemo RT, and then again come back to MDT to discuss about the chances of resectability. And uh, um, there are few surgeons, few areas where there is a less resource available. They go for primary resection first initially, and within a couple of weeks, they try to resect the if it is. A, if it is resectable, they try to resect the liver mats. And there is something called as, uh, there's the, I, I, I'm planning to take another session on the colorectal malignancies, where there is a advanced uh, colorectal malignancies, like with metastasis, with lung metastasis, with the liver metastasis, what are the liver resections? I'll take up this thing as an, uh, uh, as this thing as an another topic for discussion at some point, like in future. Right, right, okay. Thank you so much. Thank you, Aaron. Okay, uh, anyone wants to come with the questions? And uh, yes, I sorry for the thing that there's a plenty of noise in the background, so I don't know what's the reason. I try to minimize it next time and. <clears throat> Okay, okay thank well, you. a quick one. Sorry. Yeah. Hello. Yes. Yeah, Varun, well, sorry. A quick one. Uh, uh, anything on the post operative follow up? For yeah, surveillance we, come, we, we come across this thing, isn't it? Like, um, uh, if there is a really like uh, the patient comes to the follow up just for post operative follow up with the colorectal uh, uh, consultants, I don't think. Uh, uh, there is a sp specific uh, timeline for any of the follow-ups. Uh, it's usual post-operative follow-up, and if there is no synchronous, uh, depends on the type of malignancy. If it is uh, like genetic, if it is uh, sporadic, and uh, the type of uh, specimens which we have, the follow-up with the again with to the MDT for post-op chemo RT. So all these things will happen. So just we, what we have done right now is the principles of surgery. What are the principles we have to take into consideration when we do the colonic malignancy? When for the follow up, again, the patient will be discussed in MDT for the uh, chemo, RT, and the rest of the things. And also, it depends upon the histopathology, isn't it? Yeah, I, I was thinking that uh, probably yes. There's a there's a bit of a discussion uh, which is uh, to be carried on for for the new adjuvant or the ad, adjuvant therapy that's the sandwich technique, Fall Fox, yeah. Fall Giri regime, yeah. and, the, and the and the follow up with it's a huge topic. Yeah. You know, the and the follow up with the with the annual CT. Yeah, it's a very big topic. I can't take everything into uh, one thing, so slowly one by one it will be done. Like yeah, I understand. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you, Arun. Thanks for coming. Thanks for thanks everyone for joining. Uh, thanks, the thing. Yeah. If anyone wants to, um, uh, any anything, just either email or uh, post the comments in the YouTube if when it is available. Is it possible? If someone has message. Endotherapy as palliative for irresectability was so endotherapy definitely no. Uh, endotherapy or endo, uh, endoscopic mucosal resection is exclusively for T1 and T2, not more than definitely T1. And if, when you when you say it is irresectable tumor, what what do you mean by endoscopic endotherapy? No, uh, it's always palliative resection or those yeah, are two resection. Okay, thanks for coming and I would like to uh, wind off this session and thanks everyone for attending the uh, class and I hope uh, in future still uh, this thing will continue. Thanks everyone for coming. Thank you all.